space is really filled with resources that humans can use and that can make all of our lives here on Earth better. And we need people in space to help us access and utilize those resources. And that's everything from what we talk about mining and water on the moon to actually just using our orbits in space to follow things like Hurricane Dorian so we can track it and tell people that they should evacuate. There are going to be jobs for space lawyers out there as industry grows. There'll be jobs required by industry and then on the other side by the agencies, government agencies that are now short-staffed with the, the rising number of applications for launch licenses. They need more good lawyers. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from Southern California. I write a blog named May It Please the Court and have out two books titled The Sled and How to Get Sued. Well, before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Clio and Blue Jay Legal. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. You can try it for free at clio.com. That's C-L-I-O.com. And Blue Jay Legal. Blue Jay Legal's all-powered foresight platforms accurately predict court outcomes and accelerate case research by using factors instead of keywords. Learn more at bluejlegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com, bluejlegal.com. Well, space law is defined as the body of law governing space-related activities encompassing both international and domestic agreements, rules, and principles. Recently, NASA astronaut Anne McLean was accused of illegally accessing her wife's bank account during her stay on the International Space Station. Brought up a variety of legal issues and questions about how to litigate a crime committed in space. NASA is currently investigating the matter. Well, today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to explore the practice area of space law, civil and criminal, and we'll discuss pertinent case law, what legal frameworks exist for crime committed in space, as well as other legal issues currently seeing in the space law arena. Today, we've got a great show for you. Our first guest is Michelle Hanlon. She's the Associate Director of the National Center for Air and Space Law and an Instructor of Aviation and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Michelle is also the co-founder and president for All Moonkind, Inc., a nonprofit corporation that is the only organization in the world focused on protecting human cultural heritage in outer space. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thanks so much for having me, Craig. And our next guest is Mark Sundahl, professor at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law and director of Global Space Law Center at Cleveland State University. Professor Sundahl is a leading expert on the law of outer space, and he focuses primarily on the business, legal, and policy issues arising from the recent increase in private space activity. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, Craig. It's wonderful to be here. Well, Michelle, let's turn back to you for just a moment and kind of give us a framework of space law, kind of outline for us what the general rules and regulations are if, as it relates to the area we're talking about today. So the body of space law is, uh, is really an international law. We have five space treaties that have been negotiated since the 1960s. Four of them are pretty widely ratified, and the last one is not quite as popular. But what we call the Magna Carta of space law, the Outer Space Treaty, is really the document that uh, all space lawyers turn to when we consider anything that happens in space. And the interesting thing about the um, Outer Space Treaty is that it is it gives us guiding principles, A, and B, it only covers the activities of sovereigns in space. So we, what we don't have right now is any kind of law that governs the activity of humans in space. So Mark, is it that there's no type of criminal law that applies in space right now? Is Outer Space Devoid of law? Is it a lawless place? I get those questions often, and of course it's not. That's true. We have the treaties that that govern countries, the activities of countries, and and some treaties do, but it also makes, um, there's another dimension. The treaties also make states uh, responsible for the activities of their nationals, and so we have Therefore, uh, domestic regulations so that states uh, carefully watch and regulate the activities of those who 
plan to launch rockets and objects into space. So we have a, a domestic uh, layer of regulation that's fairly mature. Michelle, space law admittedly is a developing area. How did you first get interested in it? So I'm a Trekkie, and I think I, I hope everyone in the world at one point wanted to be an astronaut when they grew up. So I came at it totally from this uh, pie in the sky. I, uh, heavens are open to everybody. I believed as a little girl that anything was possible and that I personally would make it to the moon myself. Life inter- intervened, and I became a lawyer. I spent 25 years as an M&A attorney and started working with some startups, working with a lot of tech companies. Um, and working with my son, who is an aerospace engineer, and really came to realize, came to actually embrace the understanding that space is the future of humanity, not not just in terms of Star Trek and we're all going to go live on, on a spaceship or on an asteroid or, or anything, but space is really filled with resources that humans can use and that can make all of our lives here on Earth better. And we need people in space to help us access and utilize those resources. And that's everything from what we talk about mining and water on the moon to actually just using our orbits in space to follow things like Hurricane Dorian so we can track it and tell people that they should evacuate. Um, So my son actually uh, was talking to me and we started talking when he was very young about property rights in space. And I actually got involved in space law because my son wants to mine asteroids. And um, I want to make sure that we, as an international community, have the right uh, rules and regulations and laws in place so that everybody who would like to can mine asteroids and we ha- we can get the benefits of those resources to all of humanity. How about you, Mark? What triggered your interest in space law? Well, it's funny that uh, I'm sitting in the airport now on the way to D.C. to NASA headquarters for a committee meeting tomorrow on precisely that, on responsible extraction and utilization of natural resources on celestial bodies in the hopes of convincing NASA to adopt certain principles. And uh, so I'm very much interested in the same things, but my path was a little bit different. I started by studying ancient Greek law. And uh, I say that just to impress upon your younger audience that it doesn't matter where you come from or, or what your background is, you too can become a space lawyer if that's your passion. Uh, But I got into it working uh, much like my colleague uh, here in corporate international transactions, and in particular, international finance. And back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of activity in the drafting of the Space Assets Protocol of the Cape Town Convention, which created an international regime for the secured finance of satellites. So you could use satellites as collateral. Uh, and so my work in international finance brought me to space. And uh, uh, once you meet the space people and the space community, you realize what a fascinating field it is and how broad it is when you say space law, like it was said, intellectual property, uh, property rights and uh, and celestial bodies, uh, mining rights, uh, the laws of war, uh, criminal law. Uh, Space law is a very broad field that... uh, really embraces everything that we do here on Earth as it's translated into outer space. It's just amazing to think about, and it brings me back to something that Michelle mentioned, property rights, because the most I've ever understood about space is air rights, which is, you know, what my deed says that it goes up so far into the sky. But Michelle, since you brought it up, let's talk about property rights. Let's, where does space begin? Where does my property right as in, in the, the air end? And if there's a dispute in space, who decides it? Oh, well, Michelle's got to take that one. Yeah. <laughs> I think Australia is the only country in the world that actually defines where space begins, and I believe they define it as 100 kilometers up. Where the air ends and um, the air, uh, air law regime, which is governed so well by, the, by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and where space begins is one of those things that the international community just hasn't been able to agree on. People either want to set limits, set a height, based on kilometers like Australia, um, and the United States looks at it like a use. What is your, What did you use? Are you launching a rocket that's intended to go into orbit, or are you just launching a, an, a plane that's going to go high into your air? And of course, it's important because states, nations own the air over them, and that's why we have to have agreements to have people fly over 
us or the country. That's why when airlines are shot down um, tragically over the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union actually had the ability to say, well, they were in our airspace. So, and we didn't know who they were. So they had a little bit of a defense there. Um, so this is a really tricky question about when are you going to apply air law and when are you going to apply space law? From a practical matter, you know, you and me walking down the street, it's not going to matter that much. But right now, um, space is for everybody. No nation can own property in space. It cannot, no nation can make any territorial claim in space, which is why my organization for All Moon Kind is in such an interesting place because we really want to make the Apollo lunar landing sites and other incredible landing sites like Luna 2, the first soft landing, on, uh, sorry, the first hard landing ever by any human material on the moon. We think they ought to be special and they ought to be preserved, but you can't claim territory in space and our heritage laws on Earth are driven by territory. You can only suggest that a a site in your territory becomes a heritage site under the World Heritage Convention. And so it's it's questions like this, you know, I'm not I'm not really answering your question because I can't. You know, we don't we don't have this concept in space and that's what's that's what's really exciting and to Mark's point, which I think is a great one, to anybody who's interested in space, we need we need thinkers from everything, from ancient Greece to to accounting to financing to you know uh, health, because we really need to change the dynamic and change the paradigm of how we look at ourselves as a species that's going to be spacefaring and not stuck. Not I shouldn't say stuck, but not just bound to this Earth. Well, let's talk for a moment, Mark, about the uh, space force. What's going on with that, and, and how is that going to apply? I mean, do we, are we going to be shooting lasers around at different countries from space now? Well, the short answer is hopefully no. Uh, it dovetails nicely with Michelle's point about the distinction between air law and space law, because to close the loop on that, uh, right, you need consent to fly over another country if you're in the airspace. But the flip side of that is that if you believe that you're in outer space or you are in outer space, you can fly over any country without consent and engage in espionage uh, legally. And so that is why countries have been loath to set a specific altitude for the definition of outer space, because we like that flexibility of flying a little lower if we want to, or a little higher uh, with our our spy uh, vehicles. Um, but the Space Force now, so that's espionage is one part of the political military uh, contest, but what else is involved in that and how is space dealt with uh, from a military uh, perspective? And the reality is that uh, we will see uh, likely the same rules of war extended to outer space as we have here on Earth. And that might be somewhat radical for a progressive space lawyer to say. Uh, there is the language in the treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, the Magna Carta, about the the use of, of uh, outer space for exclusively peaceful purposes. And that's beautiful, aspirational language. But the devil, of course, is in the interpretation of that. And what does it mean uh, to use space for peaceful purposes? And the way that it has been virtually explained away is that peaceful purposes only prohibits uh, aggressive use of military force. And as long as you're not uh, engaged in naked aggression, then you are peaceful in your use of outer space. And that is really the same definition that applies on the surface of the Earth. There, There is another restriction, an absolute prohibition on the stationing of weapons of mass destruction in orbit. We don't want nuclear bombs uh, poised uh, in the heavens above Washington, D.C. So that's a, that is an interesting demilitarization of space. But uh, if anyone believes that the military will be devoid of, of war or, or the military, then they're mistaken. And now we have a space force, and it's perfectly legal. It all depends on what that space force does. Uh, but my perspective on that, in short, is that it's an, an unnecessary bureaucratic uh, program that only serves to stoke and fan the flames of, of uh, military conflict around the world. Because if the U.S. has a, has a space force, then every country will want a space force. Right, exactly. Well, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our, a message from our sponsors. We'll be right back. 
Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. Predict legal outcomes with Blue Jay Legal's Foresight Platforms. Using AI to analyze thousands of cases and administrative rulings, Blue Jay Legal can predict with 90% accuracy, on average, how a judge would likely rule in your case. Plus, you can research by factors and outcomes to find the relevant cases in seconds. Stay ahead of the curve and learn more at bluejaylegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com. Bluejaylegal.com. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and with us today is Michelle Hanlon. She is the Associate Director of the National Center for Air and Space Law and co-founder and the president of For All Moonkind, Inc. And Mark Sundahl, he's a professor at Cleveland Marshall College of Law and the director of the Global Space Law Center at Cleveland State University. And we've been talking about the practice area of space law and something in addition to the crime, the recent crime that's been alleged in space, uh, apparently, we have now violated whatever the prime directive was in Star Trek, which is not to interfere with uh, other civilizations or not civilizations. Uh, apparently, we've left biological beings on the moon. Michelle, what what are the problems and the circumstances with, I think, Japan ran an experiment, landed uh, some very basic uh, small microscopic animals and left them there. So we actually, you know, our biological intrusion on the moon started with Apollo uh, when our astronauts, you know, left their um, excrement bags on the moon because, you know, they wanted to get home safely. Um, So they jettisoned as as much dead weight as they could. Um, We've been polluting, if if that's what you want to call it, um, the the heavens for a while, and and orbital debris is a whole other issue. I think you know what China also um, in January ran an experiment on the far side of the moon where they actually grew lettuce seeds and I think even silkworms. I think the the latest sort of incursion is uh, what people on the Twitterverse are calling tart or I should say space lawyers. The you know this the little tiny slim dorky group of people um, are t- calling tardigate because some tardigrades which are little. Uh, polywogs that look like really miniaturized microscopic manatees were dehydrated and sent to the moon, perhaps, uh, maybe. It's a a whole issue that's being looked into, but we do have a planetary protection policy, and the international community has worked very hard on that and worked not just to protect us from from contaminants coming back. Um, You know, the Apollo astronauts were put in quarantine for, uh, what I say, two weeks, maybe a month. But we do want to be careful. And we we have identified that maybe there are biological things happening on Mars that we want to worry about. We're not worried about Venus. We're not so much worried about the moon because it's it's a category two. There's not we pretty much have determined there's nothing going on there. But but yes, we should really think and keep these in mind as we look beyond to the moons of Jupiter, Europa, things that planets that we haven't had a chance to see if they have life yet. It's smart. You know, I, I, it would not have been nice if somebody inter, interfered with the evolution of the Earth, for example, right? Maybe we wouldn't be here. Um, it's a really hard balance to take in terms of what can you take, what shouldn't you take, how intense do you want to be in, in what you're worried about taking up there and stuff. But the key to all of this and, and all of space law, I think, is Finding that balance and having that discussion, an open discussion about what we want to think, what we want to be, how we want to um, move into space. And so planetary protection is important, but I don't think it means we can't ever, you know, fundamentally just going to Mars, even with a rover, with curiosity. You know, we, we have violated Mars' environment somehow. Um, and, I, and I don't think that planetary protection is intended to actually keep us frozen in our space here on Earth. Well, that is a very interesting thought to ponder. It's a question that really needs some answering, I guess. Mark, I would like to get some, give you the opportunity to kind of tell us about the Global Space Law Center and what its purpose is and, and what's studied and what your students are excited about and what's on the, on the horizon for you. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. And I just uh, 
I was afraid you were going to ask me to respond to Michelle's comments, and I really don't have much to add to them because uh, I think she's right. Striking the right balance. What do we oppose on request of companies, and what are they able to bear? We don't want to be frozen out of the solar system. It's very well said. And we're we're trying to we got to figure out a way to establish so-called uh, you know heritage sites or cultural sites or scientific sites of interest. And that we have yet to have a mechanism for that. Uh, one idea was to have the Apollo sites designated as heritage uh, UNESCO World Heritage sites, but that requires under their regulations that it be on you know one of the members' territories. So, uh, but I think we're we're going to make some progress there. I'm working on that very issue uh, tomorrow. I'm on my way to D.C. and I'm bringing one of my students with me, and that's really what this Global Space Law Center is all about is to uh, give my students entree into the world of space law. It's hard to find it. There are only a few schools that, that give students that opportunities. There should be more. There are going to be jobs for space lawyers out there as industry grows. There'll be jobs required by industry and then on the other side by the agencies, government agencies that are now short-staffed with the, the rising number of applications for launch licenses. They need more good lawyers, and uh, that's what we're trying to turn out at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Wonderful, it's, and best of luck with that. What a laudable goal. Well, Michelle, let's give you the same opportunity for All Moon Kind. Sounds like a, a fun name. Tell us about it. Thanks. I will, if I can just add to Mark, we um, at the University of Mississippi, we actually have an LLM program. So for any lawyers out there who are really getting uh, excited by this conversation, we encourage you to uh, to come and look at our LLM program because you can take it online or come to uh, wonderful Oxford. Um, and I, I don't mean to sound like an ad, but it is wonderful and actually um, work with us here. But For All Moonkind is my, my third baby, my third child. Um, it's the, the name references, obviously, the moonwalkers and um, the, the idea that humans are going to return to the moon. But it also references that symbolically the concept that the moon and, and what we do on the moon are our first footsteps into space. And the moon, particularly Tranquility Base, um, the, the landing site of Apollo 11, is the cradle of our spacefaring human future. So the way we look at on Earth and, and we find these pockets of civilization and say, wow, you know, three million years ago in Laetoli, Tanzania, we stood up and took steps here. Um, and we treasure that because we rem it reminds us of when we couldn't even walk. And we go back and think about where we came from and how much we've innovated and how much we've done as human beings. I think it's so important that for all mankind, we think it's so vital that we preserve our first landing sites, both crewed and uncrewed, on the moon so that we can capture that. We have an opportunity. You know, it took people, uh, we didn't discover those footsteps in Laetoli until um, the 1900s, uh, the late 1900s. And they're three million years old. We don't want our great, great, great grandchildren to be shuffling around the moon trying to find Tranquility Base. We have the opportunity to protect it now. And as Mark pointed out, we can't under the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. But at For All Moonkind, we are working to do what people think is impossible. We are working to create a new convention on heritage in outer space. And we think that it's going to be the first stop, the first convention since the 1970s um, about space that the international community can agree on because we already agree on it on Earth. 193 nations have ratified the World Heritage Convention here on Earth. We just want to take those same ideals and put them into space, and we think that will be a great platform for all of the international community to collaborate on even more space issues like property and mining rights and so forth. So, I, I mean, go to our website, forallmoonkind.org. Um, we, we are just passionate about saving, not, not, it's not just space, it's saving the innovative spirit so that our children, I, I want to get a phone call from my grandchild calling from the moon and saying, wow, this, this boot print is amazing. And I can't believe those astronauts came here in that tin can that they called a spaceship. But that's what humans do because we are amazing people. And that's what we have to remember. Well, thank you for that. And I'd like to kind of turn the discussion to the interplay between science fiction and uh, space because, Michelle, I'll be the first to admit, I, I would consider myself a Trekkie and certainly have seen, and, and really my question comes basically from Star Trek, which is 
There are a significant number of inventions that were identified in Star Trek that are now in our present lives. Uh, and that has been true for science fiction throughout the ages. We imagined it, and then we created it, it seems, to some degree. And uh, what's the interplay of the, what we've all read in science fiction from Jules Verne on up, uh, and now had the pleasure to watch in television and movies? Uh, the, how close are we to coming to the reality of warp drive and those kinds of things? Warp drive, I think, uh, I think we're probably a little far away from warp drive. I like to think uh, one of the things we're doing uh, at our, on our Journal of Space Law here is we're going to start uh, reviewing science fiction books to see how realistic they are. And we're starting um, in the next volume with a review of Artemis. Of course, I don't know if you've read it, but they talk about, he talks about having a um, human presence on the moon and they talk about having, how it formed and everything. And so one of our law review articles is going to be... A, book reviews is going to look at that and how realistic is it that the, a moon settlement, a moon village would evolve that way. I think that you are seeing, I like to think, and this is like why I got into space, one of the first question that you started with, is um, because anything is possible. And we, I got my son a, a, one of those little tricorders uh, for Christmas. You know, now he, we can communicate by hitting a button on our chest. So you're right; it's right around the corner. I think the, from a physics standpoint, the the warp drive, the time travel, those are the things that might be a little bit farther out of reach. Um, and and once that's why one of the reasons it's so important that we um, create a, a human village on the moon, because one way to reduce the time it's going to take us to get to another planet that might be uh, something that can sustain human life um, would be to start from the moon rather than from Earth and to use resources from the moon rather than from Earth um, and to discover what can we do and what can we build, how can we create different chemical reactions in, in the lower gravity on the moon that will help us get to and achieve these things that right now um, physics seems to tell us aren't possible. Well, there were a lot of people at one point in time that thought it wasn't possible to fly. And that's been proven wrong time and again. <laughs> well, it looks like we've reached that's the right. yeah, looks like we've reached the end of our program. I'd like to take the opportunity to let Michelle share her final thoughts and your contact information for our guests if you'd like. Thanks so much, Craig. I just I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I think it's pretty obvious I'm really passionate about space law and about humanity's future. I just I encourage everybody to, to visit our website at foralmoonkind.org. Please feel free to reach out to me directly here at the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm M. L. Hanlon. That's M like Mary, L like Larry, H-A-N like November, L-O-N November, at olmiss.edu. And all you lawyers, we our LLM program is really fantastic. We offer more space law courses than any other um, university. And uh, we, we and my associate director, Charles Stotler, really are hands-on and will do anything we can to help you achieve your dreams in space. Great. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And unfortunately, Mark Sundahl was unable to stay with us through the end of the program. But for our listeners who might want to reach out with him and get in touch, his name is Mark Sundahl, S-U-N-D-A-H-L. His email is m dot sundahl s u n d a h l at c s u ohio dot edu. Well, that brings us to the end of our program, and we'd like to remind you that if you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com, where you can leave a comment on today's show and sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast, covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Consult a lawyer.